Chapter 14 of Good Stories for Great Birthdays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Myra Parker. Good Stories for Great Birthdays by Francis Jenkins Olcott. February 25th. Jose de San Martin of Argentina. The Protector. Part 1. February 25th. Jose de San Martin of Argentina. The Protector. Jose de San Martin, a strong and silent man, whose character and achievements have been little known or appreciated outside his own country, comes nearer than anyone else to being the George Washington of Spanish America. Lord Bryce. San Martin, the great liberator, loved men of audacity and courage. Besides, he was just and compassionate, courteous to gentle and simple alike, generous and brave, San Martin, Joseph Conrad. The white-souled San Martin, who was without fear and almost without reproach, William Spence Robertson. The moral grandeur of San Martin consists in this, that nothing is known of the secret ambitions of his life, that he was in everything disinterested, that he confined himself strictly to his mission, and that he died in silence, showing neither weakness, pride, nor bitterness, at seeing his work triumphant and his part in it forgotten. Bartolomé Mitre San Martin was born in Spanish America, February 25th, 1778 became the liberator of argentina 1812 was the hannibal of the andes 1817 he and o'higgins liberated chile 1817 to 1820 san martin resigned after the meeting with bolivar 1822 in voluntary exile he died at the age of 72 august 17th 1850. His body was brought in state to Argentina, 1880. He is called Protector of Peru. His name is pronounced Jose de San Martin. The Boy Soldier This boy soldier, who became a great general and American patriot, was born in the Indian village of Yapeo, in the district of Misiones, which is now part of Argentina. Misiones is a land of thousands of bright butterflies and brilliant flowers, of plantations and wide forests. In it are abandoned groves of wild oranges and lemons, once belonging to the Jesuit missions that gave the name of Misiones to the region. Though he was born among Indians, the boy soldier was not an Indian. He was of pure Spanish blood. His father was an officer of the Spanish crown, and was governor of Misiones. Spain ruled all of Spanish America in those days. The boy soldier's name was José de San Martín. José is Spanish for Joseph. It was an exciting life for José, with Indian boys to show him how to shoot wild game and how to fish in the Uruguay River. Then there were his father's soldiers to tell him about military life. Before Jose was eight years old, his father was transferred, and the boy was sent overseas to Spain to attend school in Madrid. But such an active American boy, accustomed to Indians and frontier life, could not stay long contented in a school in old Madrid. Besides, he had soldier's blood in his veins. He grew restless. He was only eleven, but he petitioned the Spanish government to be allowed to enlist in the army. His petition was granted, and he became a boy soldier. His uniform was white and blue. His first campaign was in Africa. His first battle was with the Moors. During the next few years, he served so gallantly that at 16 he was made a lieutenant, so he became a boy officer. The Patriot Who Kept Faith in romantic Spain, there was everything to entice young San Martin to forget his native land so far away, and the little Indian village on the Uruguay. 
the crimson and gold banners of spain waved over victorious battlefields the drums beat triumphantly the trumpets sounded to the charge there was glamour of combat with moors and other brave enemies there were romances of knights and ladies and legends of aragon castile and the alhambra there were serenades fandangos and feasts while in the quaint spanish towns maidens with dark witching eyes half hidden by mantillas peeped through the lattice casements and they must have peeped out joyously whenever the stalwart handsome young san martin went by but he never forgot his native land as the years passed he kept deep in his mind the memories of his childhood he heard that some of his countrymen in argentina had formed a patriot army and were trying to gain their independence from spanish rule he learned of their unsuccessful attempts and of their sufferings san martin heard too that the english colonies of north america had cast off the rule of their mother country england and had established a free government of the people under a constitution meanwhile napoleon bonaparte was throwing europe into confusion pulling down kings from their thrones and setting up whomsoever he wished in their stead he forced the king of spain to abdicate and proclaimed his own brother joseph bonaparte king of spain now the spanish-american colonies were the property of the kings of spain the most precious jewel in their crown some of the colonists had remained loyal but when they heard how their king had weakly abdicated many of them in disgust went over to the patriots side it was then that san martin although he had opportunities for rising much higher in the spanish army decided to return to argentina he landed on argentine soil march ninth eighteen twelve as a little boy he had left argentina now he was returned as a man offering her his sword his life his all forsaking my fortunes and my hopes said san martin later i desired only to sacrifice everything to promote the liberty of my native land i arrived at buenos aires in the beginning of eighteen twelve thenceforward i consecrated myself to the cause of spanish america when san martin came today the republic of argentina is an immense rich land it stretches from the atlantic coast westward nearly to the pacific its broad pampas or plains roll almost from the very doors of the beautiful city of buenos aires to the foothills of the andes mountains the mighty frozen peaks of the andes form a wall between the two sister republics argentina and chile though the breadth of argentina is so great its length is even more tremendous north to south the republic stretches from tropic regions of intense heat to the far distant patagonian land with its sheep ranches salt licks and arid plains and still farther southward the republic stretches toward the antarctic circle the pampas are like our prairies on them herds of cattle graze and the gauchos argentine cowboys round up the cattle on the wealthy estancias or ranches on many of these ranches grow wide acres of the finest wheat and of other grains and through the city of buenos aires which has been called the paris of america pass shipments of beef and wheat to help feed the world in the city's roadstead are ships from many countries waiting to carry away not only beef and grain but hides sugar and other argentine produce as well as patagonian mutton and wool there are flourishing towns and cities in argentina and great wealth buenos aires alone has about two million inhabitants and to buenos aires come throngs of immigrants from europe and asia seeking their fortunes in argentina just as immigrants land in the city of new york to find their fortunes in our country an immense and rich land is the republic of argentina today and her native citizens are one hundred per cent american but when san martin stepped upon argentine soil over a hundred years ago there was no great wealthy republic there were only some poor provinces struggling with spain for their liberty 
buenos aires was but a colonial town on the bank of the river of silver there was no forest of foreign ships in the roadstead for spain had forbidden trading with any land except herself there were no great estancias helping to feed the world the whole country was groaning under oppression colonists indians and gauchos were in arms to defend her the land was swarming with spanish soldiers and royalists the patriot army was small scattered and poorly equipped and undisciplined san martin with all his military knowledge came as a liberator to his country the patriot government appointed him to train soldiers and organize the army he opened a military school to it thronged the gauchos those daring riders of the plains also creoles as the colonists of pure spanish blood were called and indians and even slaves to whom san martin had promised their freedom the patriots wore cockades of white and sky blue the argentine colors in time san martin had mobilized a well-disciplined army of earnest courageous men at san lorenzo san martin won a famous victory the enemy retreated in headlong flight leaving behind banner guns and muskets after the battle san martin sent supplies to the enemy for the wounded and exchanged prisoners with them this victory put heart into the entire patriot army and assured the final success of the patriot cause argentina's independence day july ninth eighteen sixteen the birthday of the argentine republic was really may twenty fifth eighteen ten before san martin came to argentina for on that day a group of patriotic citizens of buenos aires braved the anger of spain set up a people's government and convened the first colonial assembly in argentina but on july ninth eighteen sixteen while san martin's soldiers were harassing the spaniards there assembled at the city of tucuman delegates from a number of the provinces who declared the independence of the united provinces of the river of silver or rio de la plata the name argentine republic was not given the argentine union until some years later thus argentina while spain was yet on her soil bravely declared her independence a great idea gold jewels spices and costly woods in fact much of the stupendous wealth of spanish america flowed yearly into lima the city of kings in peru on the pacific the city founded by pizarro the gold hunter triumphantly lima lifted the picturesque towers and domes of her palaces convents monasteries and religious schools and of her ancient cathedral for lima ruled not only the pacific coast of spanish america but the whole of spanish america as well she was the center of spain's power strength religion and wealth in the new world there with pomp and pageant lived the most influential of the spanish viceroys whose word was law from lima went forth spain's armies to crush the patriots in argentina and chile so long as spain should hold lima the patriot cause would be hopeless on the other hand if lima might be taken by the patriots then the stronghold of spanish tyranny would be destroyed so thought san martin and he began to lay plans to capture lima although the city was seemingly inaccessible and lay beyond the andes mountains far to the northwest on the pacific coast the argentine government transferred san martin to the province of cuyo and made him its governor there in the lovely city of mendoza the city of vineyards at the very foot of the andes he set about raising revenues and training and equipping an army a small but strong army of devoted men but how to reach lima questioned san martin to himself any attempt to lead the army northward to upper peru and over the andes to lima was sure to bring down upon the small body of patriots spain's seasoned troops who held upper peru and a part of argentina 
the only way thought san martin is to cross the andes drive the spaniards out of chile then joining our forces with those of the chilean patriots go by sea to lima and take her from spain peru will yield and our continent will be free the mighty andes what spoils my sleep is not the strength of the enemy but how to pass those immense mountains said san martin as from mendoza he gazed upon the snow-clad summits of the mighty andes whose giant wall separated the wide plains of argentina from the sunny smiling valleys of chile on the pacific terrible seemed the andes stretching from north to south like an impassable barrier near mendoza the barren foothills resembled waves of a petrified sea above them soared the central lofty mountain ranges of conical sharply defined peaks white with everlasting snow over the precipices wheeled the condors at dizzy height and down the chasm rent sides of the mountains rushed dark torrents of melted snow san martin knew of the rugged defiles the narrow paths winding along the edges of precipices the ice-choked passages the gloomy gorges and the many unbridged torrents to be crossed torrents tossing rocks about like straws nevertheless he determined to lead his army across the andes rescue chile and go by sea to lima so without haste he carefully laid his plans in every detail he spent two years in raising the army of the andes and equipping it he kept his project of crossing into chile secret lest the enemy should hear of it and guard the mountain passes the enthusiastic and loyal men of mendoza and of the whole province of cuyo helped him with money and labor many of them enlisted even the children wanted to help so san martin to keep up their patriotism formed them into little regiments and let them drill and carry banners their mothers led by san martin's wife a lovely argentine lady took off their jewels and sold them if it had not been for the cheerful spirit of cooperation among the folk of cuyo san martin could not have mobilized his men for this reason mendoza is called the nest of the argentine eagle Bartolome Mitre retold the real san martin and what was general san martin like why did the good folk of mendoza love him and hasten to do all that he asked why did his troops cheerfully submit to terrible privations and willingly plunge into danger and death if san martin was with them why today do the boys and girls of argentina wish to be like their great and beloved hero san martin first because san martin never thought of himself the folk of mendoza offered him a handsome house to live in he quietly refused it he gave up to the cause half of his salary as governor he accepted the rank of general with the understanding that he might lay it down as soon as argentina was free he steadfastly refused all other promotions from his government he sent his wife back to buenos aires so that he might live more simply he lived frugally ate little and worked hard and what did he look like this general so strong yet so simple he wore the plain uniform of the mounted grenadiers with a white and sky-blue cockade in his hat he was fine-looking tall and muscular his complexion was olive his jaw strong and his lips firm his black hair thick his large jet-black eyes looked out from under bushy eyebrows eyes now kindly and humorous now piercingly observant but when he met treachery or cowardice those eyes could frown terribly and when he faced dangers or great emergencies they expressed a fiery determined spirit a man nobly unselfish gentle yet forceful modest patient whimsically humorous at times but always a few words was san martin even strangers who met him were filled with respect and affection for him his motto was thou shall be what thou oughtest to be or thou shall be nothing the fighting engineer of the andes among the patriots of mendoza was a begging friar named luis beltran he had fought in chile against the spaniards 
he had returned across the indies to mendoza with a kit of tools on his back he was a clever fellow a mathematician a chemist an artilleryman a maker of watches and fireworks a carpenter an architect a blacksmith a draughtsman a cobbler and a physician he was strong and rugged san martin made him chaplain but on learning of his extraordinary gifts he appointed him to establish an arsenal soon friar beltran had three hundred workmen under him all of whom he taught he cast cannon shot and shell melting down church bells when his metal gave out he made limbers for the guns saddles for the cavalry knapsacks shoes and other equipment for the soldiers he forged horseshoes and bayonets and repaired damaged muskets if he stopped to rest at all he drew designs on the walls of his grimy workshop for special caissons and wagons to transport army supplies over the steep passes of the andes then he took off his frock and put on the uniform of a lieutenant of the artillery and became the fighting engineer of the army of the andes bartolome mitre retold the hannibal of the andes one everything was ready friar beltran's forges blazing night and day had turned out thirty thousand horseshoes his arsenal had produced bullets by the hundreds of thousands friar beltran's carriages for artillery specially designed for mountain passes stood waiting the guns themselves were to be carried on the backs of mules slings had been prepared to hoist the mules over dangerous places also sleds of rawhide in which the guns might be hauled up inclines too steep for heavily laden mules to climb the women of mendoza led by bernardo o'higgins mother and sister who were exiles from chile had prepared a store of bandages and medicines and had made uniforms for the soldiers all was ready tents provisions herds of cattle saddles arms clothes water bottles cables and anchors for a portable bridge muleteers and artisans nothing was overlooked by the vigilant san martin silent and reserved he inspected everything for he knew too well that the mountains over which he was about to lead his army were more lofty and dangerous than the famous alps he planned to send the army through two passes the highest of which was nearly thirteen thousand feet above sea level the troops would be long on the way he knew and the dangers would be terrific in january eighteen seventeen january is summertime in argentina the good folk of mendoza gathered to say farewell to the army that they had helped to mobilize and to which many of their own men belonged some of whom they should never see again the army broke up its cantonments and began its march in three divisions carrying the new flag of the republic the women of mendoza had made it it was white and sky blue like san martin's first uniform when he was a boy soldier while on it was emblazoned the face of the rising sun so with provisions for many days with armament munitions baggage and great herds of cattle for food the army followed the trails that led through the barren foothills toward the high andes the lofty central ranges of the gloomy mountains frowned down upon the soldiers while the dark passes seemed yawning piteously to devour them but nothing daunted they courageously continued to climb the foothills toward the mountains bernardo o'higgins the chilean patriot led one of the divisions for chile had now joined forces with argentina against spain higher and higher the army climbed scouts clearing the way before it until it began to enter the passes of the cordilleras then san martin who was still tearing at mendoza wrote to a friend this afternoon i leave to join the army god grant me success in this great enterprise then saying good-bye to the folk of mendoza by whom he was so much beloved he hastened to join one of the divisions 
day after day the troops followed the steep ascents and descents walking close to roaring torrents crossing craggy peaks and narrow chasms skirting edges of precipices wading through snow and hauling heavy guns and supplies up steep inclines great mountain ridges with canyons between ran north and south beside numerous lesser ridges all these had to be crossed to reach chile the intense cold on the summits killed many of the soldiers while the rarefied air caused numbers to drop down and die from heart failure and exhaustion of the nine thousand two hundred and eighty one mules and the sixteen hundred horses friar beltran had in charge over half perished the soldiers surrounded by the mountain peaks that seemed to touch the sky with their snow-bound jagged tops were depressed by the awful loneliness now and then a condor wheeled above them strange noises made by gusts of wind in the canyons sounded like the wails of lost souls every step the soldiers took convinced them that should they be attacked it would be impossible to retreat such were some of the terrible hardships uncomplainingly suffered by the army of the andes but the soldiers laughed at despair a spirit of union and comradeship upheld them each corps tried to outdo the others in cheerful endurance at last after more than three weeks the army began to defile from the passes into chile then san martin and o'higgins in the great battle of chacabuco and later at maipu won the victory and drove the spanish army from chile general miller and bartolome mitre retold two thus was accomplished one of the most heroic feats in history the passage of the andes by the army of san martin says lord bryce has been pronounced by military historians of authority to have been one of the most remarkable operations ever accomplished in mountain warfare the forces which he led were no doubt small compared to those which hannibal and napoleon carried across the alps but the passes to be crossed were much higher lord bryce also says that san martin comes nearer than any one else to being the george washington of spanish america and san martin has been called the hannibal of the andes not for himself honors were showered on san martin after the battle of chacabuco news of his successful crossing of the andes and of his victory reached buenos aires all day long shouts sounded through the streets cannon roared from the fort and from the squadron in the roadstead san martin's portrait was hung where all could see it draped in flags captured from the enemy the argentine government decreed a sword and badge for san martin and struck medals for his soldiers they voted a pension of six hundred dollars a year for his little daughter maria mercedes they also sent him a commission as brigadier general the highest rank in the argentine service san martin accepted the pension for his little daughter and laid the money aside for her education but he refused the commission asking only for more arms money and men to carry on the campaign meanwhile the grateful chilean government offered to make him ruler of all chile but this honor too he declined so his friend and companion at arms bernardo o'higgins in his stead was elected supreme ruler of the country cochran el diablo on to lima on to lima was now the cry of the argentine and chilean soldiers let us drive out the spaniards let us expel them from spanish america forever on to lima by sea was san martin's decision meanwhile o'higgins was busy equipping a fleet to carry the troops to peru there was at that time in england a dauntless dashing naval officer lord thomas cochrane who was famous for his extraordinary courage and adventures he gladly accepted the invitation of san martin and o'higgins to become admiral of the chilean navy and because excitement and danger were as meat and drink to him he hastened to chile 
he was welcomed with great rejoicings his beautiful young wife became one of the bells of santiago english irish and american officers drawn by the fame of lord cochrane's daring exploits arrived in numbers offering their swords to chile to help win her freedom then with the single star flag of chile nailed to his mastheads admiral cochrane swept the pacific clean of spanish war vessels and so fiery were his attacks that the spaniards nicknamed him el diablo for the very devil himself he is said they our brothers ye shall be free the peruvians are our brothers proclaimed san martin to his soldiers remember that you are come not to conquer but to liberate a people he proclaimed as soon as the liberating army was landed in peru for lord cochrane had brought them safely thither aboard the chilean fleet then to the peruvians san martin sent broadcast a proclamation you shall be free and independent you shall form your government and your laws according to the spontaneous wish of your own representatives the soldiers of the army of liberation your brothers will exert no influences military or civil direct or indirect in your social system whenever it suits you dismiss the army which marches to protect you a military force should never occupy the territory of a free people unless invited by its legitimate magistrates this proclamation aroused the patriotism of many peruvians who brought quantities of food and supplies to the army while numbers of them joined the army including six hundred slaves to whom san martin promised their freedom then san martin prepared to invest lima with the help of lord cochrane's fleet end of chapter fourteen recording by myra parker chapter fifteen of good stories for great birthdays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by myra parker good stories for great birthdays by francis jenkins olcott february twenty fifth jose de san martin of argentina the protector part two the fall of the city of the kings lima the city of the kings stands not far from the sea on a plain near the foot of the cordilleras when san martin landed in peru lima the proud the rich was the seat of the spanish viceroy's court with all its pomp and vices she was shut in by walls above which rose her turrets and domes many of her people were slaves indians or freedmen the rest were haughty spanish grandees and rich royalists lima was the civil and military despot of all spanish america san martin had now but one thought and aim to drive the spaniards from lima and make the city independent he besieged her by sea and land through proclamations sent far and wide he urged the peruvians to rise up and help gain their own freedom peruvian colonists indians and slaves flocked to his standard the siege began to tell on lima her pride was humbled to the dust her food was exhausted fresh supplies were cut off by the blockade the poor suffered dreadful want the rich were deprived of their luxuries rich and poor alike lived in terror of their lives to add to the miseries of the unhappy city her officials who should have protected her fell to quarrelling among themselves on the fifth of july universal terror reigned the spanish viceroy had announced that he was about to abandon the city to her fate every one believed that san martin's troops would fall upon her to pillage and burn at dawn the viceroy marched out with his troops there was one mad rush to escape to cayo the port of lima several miles away all the people who could hastened to leave crowds of fugitives hurried along the highways people on foot in carts on horseback men women and children with bundles and household goods 
with horses and mules and with slaves bending under heavy burdens of baggage and treasure inside the city there was pandemonium women were seen fleeing toward the convents the narrow streets were choked with loaded wagons and mounted horsemen by midday scarcely a person was to be seen those who had been forced to remain had barred their doors and closed their shutters and were waiting with fear and trembling for san martin's troops to fall upon the city in the midst of this confusion the few officials who had not fled gathered together to consult as to what should be done they feared an uprising of the slaves or an attack by a mob but greater still was their fear of the multitude of san martin's armed indians savage and undisciplined who were surrounding the city for though the indians were under the command of san martin's officers they seemed likely at any moment to break loose from restraint and massacre the helpless people of lima the indians were so near that they could plainly be seen perched on the heights that overhung the city the officials in great terror of mind wrote a letter to san martin entreating him to enter lima and protect her the letter was dispatched by a messenger all night long a profound silence brooded over the city the next morning san martin's answer came it was brief he would enter the city he said only if it was the real wish of the people of lima to declare their independence he had no desire to enter as a conqueror he declared but would come only if invited by the people and added he that the people in the meanwhile might give whatever orders they desired to his troops surrounding the city and the orders should be obeyed his answer stunned the officials they could not believe that a conquering general could be so humane to a helpless foe they thought that san martin was mocking them but to put the matter to the test they sent an order to a commanding officer of a regiment stationed near the city gate asking him to withdraw his men to a spot a league away the officer immediately withdrew them the good news flew through the city people went almost mad with joy confidence was restored and parties of picked soldiers were invited in to guard the city in a day or two everything was as before the shops were opened again women were seen stealing from the convents men ventured into the square to smoke their cigars the streets were lined with refugees returning to their homes bringing back bundles trunks and treasures the street criers were bawling their wares and the city was restored to its usual noise and bustle then a deputation of citizens waited upon san martin to invite him to enter lima and proclaim her independence captain basil hall retold san martin the conqueror a retreat the people watched eagerly to see san martin enter in state as a conquering general should the day passed and he did not come when it began to grow dark he rode in through the gate attended by a single aide-de-camp and he would not have come then if he could have helped it it was his plan to slip unobserved into the city early in the morning before people were up but the reason why he had to enter at evening was this he was tired and he had just settled down for the night in the corner of a little cottage outside the walls he was blessing his stars that he was well out of the reach of business when in came two friars who had discovered his hiding place each one made him a long tedious speech one likened him to caesar and the other to lucutius good heavens exclaimed san martin when the friars had left what are we to do this will never answer oh sir replied the aide-de-camp there are two more of the same stamp close at hand indeed then saddle the horses again and let us be off exclaimed san martin so it happened that the conquering general was forced to retreat and enter lima before people were asleep the mother and her three sons when he entered the city instead of going directly to the palace where he was to lodge he stopped to call on the governor in a moment the news of his arrival sped through the city people came thronging into the governor's house and even filled the court and street san martin was forced to stand in the audience chamber and receive the crowds 
old people and young people pressed fast upon him but though he was so modest and heartily disliked any show or pretension he received their praises patiently and kindly a handsome middle-aged woman approached him and as he leaned forward to greet her she threw herself at his feet there clinging to his knees she looked up into his face and exclaimed that she had three sons at his service who she hoped would become useful citizens san martin listened to her with respect as he gently raised her from the floor she flung her arms around his neck and finished her speech he replied to her with great earnestness and the poor woman's heart seemed bursting with gratitude for his attention and kindness the little girl who was bashful san martin then seeing a little girl about ten or twelve years old who was too bashful to come forward lifted the astonished child and kissed her cheek when he set her down again the little thing was in such ecstasy that she scarcely knew what to do another little girl san martin established his headquarters a little beyond the city wall there he was completely surrounded by business but every man coming out of san martin's presence seemed pleased whether he had succeeded in his petition or not among others an old man came into headquarters holding a little girl in his arms he had just one request would the great general please kiss his child san martin good-naturedly kissed her and the father went away radiantly happy the best cigar san martin lived on the friendliest terms with his officers one day at his own table he opened his pouch and took out a cigar rounder and firmer than the rest he gave it a look of unconscious satisfaction just then a voice called my general san martin started from his reverie and raised his head who spoke he said it was i said an officer who had been watching him i merely wished to beg the favor of one cigar from you aha said san martin smiling good-naturedly with an assumed look of reproach and at once he tossed his chosen cigar to the officer duty before the general at another time san martin was entertaining a visitor on board a schooner while they were walking up and down the sailors began to swab the deck what plague is this said san martin that these fellows will insist on washing their decks at this rate then turning to one of the men he said i wish my friend you would not wet us here but go to the other side the sailor who had his duty to perform and who was too well accustomed to the general's gentle manner went on with his work and soundly splashed him and his guest i am afraid cried san martin we must go below although our cabin is but a miserable hole for really there is no persuading these fellows to go out of their usual way captain basil hall and other sources retold lima's greatest day july twenty eighth eighteen twenty one peru's independence day it was lima's greatest day it was the twenty eighth of july it was her independence day flowers and perfumes were being showered down from palace windows and balconies they fell on the heads of san martin and many officers clergy and officials who were marching through cheering crowds they marched to the great square and mounted a platform the troops were drawn up in the square the declaration of independence of peru was read aloud then san martin standing on the platform unfurled the new flag of the republic of peru as he shook out its scarlet and white folds on which was the face of the sun rising over the andes with a tranquil river at their base he called in a loud voice from this moment peru is free and independent by the common wish of the people and by the justice of her cause which god defend then waving the flag on high he shouted long live the fatherland long live liberty long live independence long live the fatherland shouted the crowds as they caught up his words and passed them along from the square to the streets beyond the bells of the city rang out a joyous peal cannon were fired and such a roar of voices went up as was never heard before in lima then from the platform silver medals were rained down on the crowds on each was inscribed lima being liberated 
swore its independence on the 28th of July, 1821, under the protection of the Liberating Army of Peru, commanded by San Martin. San Martin adopted the title of Protector of Peru. He took upon himself the temporary government of the country until its independence should be assured. I do not want military renown, said San Martin. I have no ambition to be the conqueror of Peru. I want solely to liberate the country from oppression. Hail, neighbor republics! San Martin continued to wage his successful campaign against the Spaniards. Now let us leave him and Peru for a moment. Let us turn to the United States and see what we were doing about all this. We recognized our sister republics for the first time on March 8, 1822. On that day, President Monroe sent a special message to Congress saying, The provinces belonging to this hemisphere are our neighbors. He recommended that Congress should recognize as independent nations Colombia, Chile, Peru, Mexico, and Argentina, then called La Plata. Brazil had already acknowledged them, so the United States was the second power to hold out the hand of fellowship to our neighbors. England followed soon after. This acknowledgment of a brave people's struggle for freedom came after more than 20 years of terrible warfare. Our neighbor republics, recognized in 1822, have the honor of having won their own liberty without the aid of foreign allies, for though they had the sympathy of all free peoples and the moral support of both the English and the United States governments, and though hundreds of foreign young men, whole legions of them, volunteered in the Patriot armies and shed their blood for Spanish-American independence, yet the Patriots of the Southern Republics had to stand up alone and unaided by any government. They won their independence by patient endurance of every conceivable suffering, by rising above momentary defeats, and by courageously persisting to the end under the command of their devoted liberators. In the language of San Martin, God granted them success. America for the Americans So at last... The Spanish-American republics were recognized. Their freedom was practically won. But the kings of continental Europe felt their thrones tottering and their crowns loosened. After the wars of Napoleon, the whole of Europe was in political ferment. So it always happens after long wars. The peoples of continental Europe, who for generations had been downtrodden by kings and emperors, had learned from the United States and France of such things as liberty, constitutions, and the right of peoples to a voice in their own government. Everywhere, the peoples of Europe were preparing to demand constitutional governments. Then, too, a wave of infidelity was sweeping through the world, the result of the terrible French Revolution. Then, in 1815, the three kings of Russia, Prussia, and Austria formed a league called the Holy Alliance. Its original purpose was lofty. It was, at first, a very pious affair. The holy allies agreed to take under their Christian protection the kingdoms of Europe, and to govern their three peoples as one people by the dictates of the holy religion of Christ. They pledged themselves to bring about a reign of charity, justice, and peace for Europe. The Holy Allies claimed to be divinely appointed to do all this. Spain, France, Naples, and Sardinia joined them. England did not become a member, for though she has a monarch, she has a constitutional government. It was not long before this Holy Alliance became a hotbed of European intrigue and developed into a subtle political league to destroy the awakening liberties of the world. The Holy Allies conspired to put down all democratic principles and stamp out all representative government from Europe. They also conspired to prevent the formation of any new republics in other parts of the world and to chain the liberty of the press, which is the voice of the people. 
thus these holy allies joined forces to uphold the divine right of kings and the tyranny of absolute monarchies their next move was to promise spain to help destroy the spanish american republics and thus restore to her her lost colonies this was after we had acknowledged the independence of those republics the holy allies planned to invade america with their army when this news reached the united states there was a furor and when added to this news it was announced that russia was laying plans to colonize the pacific coast of north america there was great indignation in this country it was then that president monroe on december second eighteen twenty three gave to the world the famous monroe doctrine which is this to the defense of our own government which has been achieved by the loss of so much blood and treasure and under which we have enjoyed unexampled felicity this whole nation is devoted that the american continents by the free and independent conditions which they have assumed and maintained are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any european powers we should consider any attempt on their part to extend their system to any portion of this hemisphere as dangerous to our peace and safety but with the governments the spanish american republics who have declared their independence and maintained it and whose independence we have acknowledged we could not view any interposition for the purpose of oppressing them or controlling in any other manner their destiny by any european power in any other light than as the manifestation of an unfriendly disposition toward the united states this is the monroe doctrine america for the americans american independence is what it means what one american did october ninth eighteen twenty now to return to south america and its struggle that was bravely and cleverly done exclaimed joseph viamil viamil was an american a citizen of the united states who had cast in his lot with the spanish american patriots at his house in guayaquil a city now part of ecuador the local patriots met to discuss plans the province and city of guayaquil lay on the northern border of peru they were still under spanish rule they were garrisoned by fifteen hundred spanish soldiers the patriots decided to capture the garrison so while san martin was preparing to besiege lima they set out from villamil's house led by a venezuelan officer villamil accompanied them with a band of englishmen and north americans who were eager to help in the attack they took the garrison in double quick time and with very little bloodshed at that for scarcely eight men were killed that was bravely and cleverly done said viamil and that he himself had fought bravely and cleverly during the attack was soon proven for the provincial government of guayaquil dispatched him aboard a schooner to carry the good news to lord cochrane and san martin some time after there took place at guayaquil one of the most amazing meetings the world has ever seen the amazing meeting this amazing meeting at guayaquil was like the dramatic climax of an exciting story there was a mystery in it it happened a few months after the freeing of guayaquil the people of the city dressed in their gayest clothes were crowding along the streets and craning their necks to watch for a procession triumphal arches spanned the streets on each arch was inscribed bolivar and while the people watched eagerly lo the new white and blue flag of independent guayaquil was hauled down from the gunboats on the river and in its place were run up the red yellow and blue colors of the great new republic of colombia which had just been formed to the north of guayaquil then there was a sudden burst of military music and under the triumphal arches marched a procession of officers in brilliant uniforms and soldiers with bayonets and astride his war-horse cocked hat in hand rode simon bolivar 
the venezuelan liberator small erect and elegant he had been leading his conquering army down from the north driving out the spaniards while at the same time san martin had been freeing the republics of argentina and chile and convoying his army up from the south to the liberation of peru it was general bolivar who had founded the new and great republic of colombia and had given it a constitutional government he was now come to guayaquil on his way to liberate peru he rode thus proudly under the arches that bore his name his alert bright black eyes turned to the right and left as he took in every detail around him soon after this the amazing meeting took place san martin the protector arrived at guayaquil to confer with bolivar strong spanish forces were gathering in peru concentrating for a terrible and final struggle san martin's army had been weakened by disease and losses he was now come to ask bolivar to join his forces with the patriot army in peru and so help bring the war to a quick and decisive end thus the two great patriots met in the gaily decked tropic city one had liberated all the northern part of spanish america the other had brought independence to two southern republics bolivar small alert sagacious a vivid personality and iron will impatient of restraint elegantly clad in full dress uniform san martin stalwart earnest simple yet strong dressed in plain garments on the result of their conference hung the completed freedom of all spanish america they were left alone they conferred for more than an hour no one knew what they discussed but those who caught glimpses of them said that bolivar seemed agitated while san martin was grave and calm after the conference san martin sent his baggage back to the ship the next day they conferred again again nobody knew what they discussed that night san martin went aboard his ship and sailed for peru what happened afterward then came the results of that amazing meeting san martin returned to peru and announced that bolivar was coming with his army to aid the country he then resigned his command refusing all the honors heaped upon him by the grateful peruvian government but he said that if the republic of peru were ever in danger he would glory in joining as a citizen in her defense then to the sorrowing peruvian people he issued a farewell address assuring them that since their independence was secured he was now about to fulfill his sacred promise and leave them to govern themselves adding god grant that success may preside over your destinies and that you may reach the summit of felicity and peace that same night san martin mounted his horse and rode away into the darkness he had left peru forever he passed through chile and laid down his command then he crossed the andes to rest for a while on his little farm at mendoza there the terrible news reached him that his wife had died in buenos aires all that she had meant to him he himself expressed in the simple words the wife and friend of general san martin his trials were not yet over for on his reaching buenos aires its officials met him coldly and scornfully then san martin ill sorrowful and forsaken took his little daughter in his arms and going aboard a ship sailed for europe thus he left argentina and went into voluntary exile he never saw buenos aires again five years later longing to retire quietly on his farm at mendoza he returned to argentina he never left the ship he learned that if he did so old political factions would rise up again and civil war might threaten argentina so he sailed back to europe there he looked after his daughter's education and in his old age he lived comfortably in a small country house on the bank of the seine 
he cared for his garden tended his flowers and read his books until his sight began to fail at the age of seventy-two still a voluntary exile for the good of his country he died in his dear daughter's arms i desire said he that my heart should rest in buenos aires the mystery solved what was the mystery that made san martin at the height of his success bow his head in silence and go into voluntary exile his enemies reviled him even some of his friends accused him of deserting his post in time of need. But he neither complained nor explained. A great act of self-abnegation may not be hidden forever. Years passed by, then San Martin's noble purpose came to light. At that amazing meeting, after he and Bolivar had exchanged opposing views as to the best form of government for Spanish America, they began to discuss the liberation of Peru. Bolivar refused to enter Peru or to allow his army to do so without the consent of the Congress of Colombia. He politely offered to send San Martin a few troops, altogether too few to aid in the subjection of the large Spanish forces gathering in Peru for the final decisive struggle. San Martin, at a glance, read the liberator's purpose. He saw before him a brilliant general of a constancy to which difficulties only added strength, who by joining his army to that of Peru, Argentina, and chile could make sure for all time to come the liberation of the whole of spanish america but it was also plain to san martin that bolivar would never consent to share his command with any other man therefore san martin offered to lay down the sword of supreme command of his forces in peru and serve as an ordinary officer under bolivar this bolivar refused San Martin was pushed to the wall. There was left only one of two things for him to do, either to return to Peru and wage an unequal and possibly losing warfare against the Spaniards without the help of Bolivar, or to withdraw. He withdrew in silence. But why in silence? Why did he not explain so that people might understand and not misjudge him? in a letter that he wrote from peru to bolivar giving his reasons for retiring he told why he was silent the sentiments which this letter contains will remain buried in the most profound silence if they were to become public our enemies might profit by them and injure the cause of liberty while ambitious and intriguing people might use them to foment discord again he said it shall not be San Martin who will give a day's delight to the enemy. And on leaving Peru, he said in his farewell to the people, My countrymen, as in most affairs, will be divided in opinion. Their children will give a true verdict. And their children have justified his faith. Today, his body rests in the cathedral of Buenos Aires. And today, the school children of Argentina are taught to love and reverence the father of their country who never thought of himself. Jose de San Martin End of chapter 15 Recording by Myra Parker Chapter 16 of Good Stories for Great Birthdays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Good Stories for Great Birthdays by Francis Jenkins Olcott. March 15th, Andrew Jackson, Old Hickory. Our Federal Union, it must and shall be preserved. Andrew Jackson's Toast on Jefferson's Birthday. I want to say that Andrew Jackson was a Tennessean, but Andrew Jackson was an American, 
and there is not a state in this nation that cannot claim him that has not the right to claim him as a national hero i should not say that old hickory was faultless i do not know very many strong men that have not got some of the defects of their qualities but andrew jackson was as upright a patriot as honest a man as fearless a gentleman as ever any nation had in public or private life president theodore roosevelt andrew jackson was born in the carolinas march fifteenth seventeen sixty seven won the battle of talladega against the creeks eighteen thirteen won the battle of new orleans against the british january eighth eighteen fifteen was made governor of florida eighteen twenty one was elected president eighteen twenty eight again eighteen thirty two he died june eighth eighteen forty five he is sometimes called old hickory mischievous andy set the case you are shawnee cares mayor and me billy buck and i should mount you and you should kick fall fling and break your neck should i be to blame for that imagine this gibberish roared out by a sandy-haired boy as he came leaping from the door of a log schoolhouse ready to defy all the other boys to a race a wrestle or a jumping match while he playfully laid sprawling as many of his friends as he could trip unawares there you have handy jackson andy tall lank red-headed blue-eyed freckled barefoot and dressed in coarse copperous colored clothes was the son of a poor scotch-irish widow he was born and reared in the carolinas he lived with his mother in the Waxhaws settlement. His home was a log cabin in a clearing. His mother earned her living and that of her two youngest boys. She had great ambitions for Andy. She sent him to school in the little log schoolhouse, and when she had earned enough money, she paid his tuition at a country academy. No boy ever lived who liked fun better than Andy. He ran foot races, leaped the bar, and high jumped. To the younger boys, who never questioned his mastery, he was a generous protector. There was nothing he would not do to defend them. But boys of his own age and older found him self willed, somewhat overbearing, easily offended very irascible and on the whole difficult to get along with he learned to read write and cast accounts little more james parton retold reading the declaration andy was nine years old when the declaration of independence was signed at philadelphia in august someone brought a philadelphia newspaper to the waxhaws it contained a portion of the declaration a crowd of waxhaw patriots gathered in front of the country store owned by andy's uncle crawford they were eager to hear the declaration read aloud andy was chosen to read it he did so proudly in a shrill penetrating voice he read the whole thing through without once stopping to spell out the words and that was more than many of the grown men of the waxhaws could do in those pioneer days when frontier log schoolhouses were few and far between out against tarleton andrew jackson was little more than thirteen when the british tarleton with his dragoons thundered along the red roads of the waxhaws and dyed them a deeper red with the blood of the surprised patriot militia for tarleton fell upon the waxhaw settlement and killed one hundred and thirteen of the militia and wounded a hundred and fifty more the wounded men were abandoned to the care of the settlers and quartered in the cabins and in the old log waxhaw meeting-house which was turned into a hospital 
Andrew's mother was one of the kind women who nursed the soldiers in the meeting house. Andrew and his brother Robert assisted her in waiting upon them. Andrew, more enraged than pity, though pitiful by nature, burned to avenge their wounds and his brother's death. For his eldest brother, Hugh, had mounted his horse the year before and ridden southward to join the Patriot forces. He had fought gallantly and had died bravely. Tarleton's massacre at the Waxhaws had kindled the flames of war in all that region of the Carolinas. The time was now come when Andrew and Robert were to play men's parts. Carrying their own weapons, they mounted their grass ponies, ponies of the South Carolina swamps, rough, Shetlandish, wild, and rode away to join the Patriots. Andrew and Robert served in a number of actions and were finally taken captive. They were at length rescued by their mother. This heroic woman arrived at their prison and by her efforts and entreaties succeeded in bringing about an exchange of prisoners. Andrew and Robert were brought out of prison and handed over to her. She gazed at them in astonishment and horror. So worn and wasted the boys were with hunger, wounds, and disease. They were both ill with the smallpox. Robert could not stand, nor even sit on horseback, without support. Two horses were procured. One Mrs. Jackson rode herself. Robert was placed on the other, and held in his seat by some of the prisoners, to whom Mrs. Jackson had just given liberty. Behind the sad procession, poor Andrew dragged his weak and weary limbs, bareheaded, barefooted, without a jacket, his only two garments torn and dirty. The forty miles of lonely wilderness to the Waxhaws were nearly traversed, and the fevered boys were expecting in two hours more to enjoy the comfort of home when a chilly, drenching rain set in. The smallpox had reached that stage when a violent chill proves well-nigh fatal. The boys reached home and went to bed. In two days, Robert Jackson was dead, while Andrew was a raving maniac. But the mother's nursing and his own strong constitution brought Andrew out of his peril and set him on the way to slow recovery. James Parton retold. An Orphan of the Revolution Andrew Jackson was no sooner out of danger than his courageous mother resolved to go to Charleston, a distance of nearly two hundred miles, and do what she could for the comfort of the prisoners confined on the reeking, disease-infested prison ships. Among the many captives on the ships suffering hunger, sickness, and neglect, were Mrs. Jackson's own nephews and some of her Waxhaw neighbors. She hoped to obtain their release, as she had that of Andrew and Robert. She arrived at Charleston and gained admission to the ships. She distributed food and medicines, and brought much comfort and joy to the haggard prisoners. She had been there but a little time when she was seized by ship fever. After a short illness, she died. She was buried on the open plain, and her grave was lost sight of. Her clothes, a sorry bundle, were sent to her boy at the Waxhaws. And so Andrew Jackson, before reaching his fifteenth birthday, had lost his father, mother, and two brothers. He was an orphan, a sick and sorrowful orphan, a homeless orphan, an orphan of the Revolution. Many years later on his birthday, on the same day when he disbanded the army with which he had won the Battle of New Orleans, he said of his mother, quote, 
How I wish she could have lived to see this day. There never was a woman like her. She was gentle as a dove and brave as a lioness. Her last words have been the law of my life. When the tidings of her death reached me, I at first could not believe it. When I finally realized the truth, I felt utterly alone. Yes, I was alone. With that feeling, I started to make my own way. The memory of my mother and her teachings were after all the only capital I had to start in life with, and on that capital I have made my way." Quote. James Parton and Other Sources The Hooting in the Wilderness It was night in the Tennessee wilderness. A train of settlers from the Carolinas with four-wheeled ox carts and pack horses and attended by an armed guard, was winding its way along the trail through the forest toward the frontier town of Nashville. They had marched thirty-six hours, a night and two days, without stopping to rest. They were keeping a vigilant outlook for savages. At length they reached what they thought was a safe camping ground. The tired travelers hastened to encamp. Their little tents were pitched, their fires were lighted, the exhausted women and children crept into the tents and fell asleep. The men, except those who were to stand sentinel during the first half of the night, wrapped their blankets around them and lay down under the lee of sheltering logs with their feet to the fire. Silence fell on the camp. All slept except the sentinels and one young man. He sat with his back to a tree, smoking a corn-cob pipe. He was not handsome, but the direct glance of his keen blue eyes and his resolute expression made him seem so in spite of a long, thin face, high forehead somewhat narrow, and sandy red hair falling low on his brow. This young man was Andrew Jackson, mischievous Andy, of the Waxhaws, now grown to be a clever, licensed young lawyer. He was going with the immigrant train to Nashville in order to hang out his sign and practice on the frontier. He sat there in the wilderness, in the darkness, peacefully smoking. He listened to the night sounds from the forest. He was falling into a doze, when he noted the various hoots of owls in the forest around him. A remarkable country this for owls, he thought, as he closed his eyes and fell asleep. Just then, an owl, whose hooting had sounded at a distance, suddenly uttered a peculiar cry close to the camp. In a moment, young Jackson was the whitest awake man in Tennessee. He grasped his rifle and crept cautiously to where his friend Circe was sleeping, and woke him quietly. Circe, said he, raise your head and make no noise. What's the matter? asked Circe. The owls, listen, there, there again. Isn't that a little too natural? Do you think so? asked Circe. I know it, replied young Jackson. There are Indians all around us. I have heard them in every direction. They mean to attack before daybreak. In a few minutes, the men of the camp were aroused. The experienced woodsmen among them listened to the hooting and agreed with young Jackson that there were Indians in the forest. Jackson advised that the camp should be instantly and quietly broken up and the march resumed. This was done, and the company heard nothing more of the savages. But a party of hunters who reached the same camping ground an hour after the company had left it lay down by the fires, then slept. Before day dawned, the Indians were upon them and killed all except one of the party. But the long train of immigrants, men, women, and children, were safely continuing their wearisome journey through the wilderness. At last, they reached Nashville to the joy of the settlers there. 
and a great piece of news young Andrew Jackson brought with him to Nashville. The Constitution of the United States had just been ratified and adopted by a majority of the states of the Union. James Parton retold. Fort Mims the War of 1812 was made terrible by an uprising of the Indians. The Creeks, incited and armed by British officers, attacked Fort Mims in Alabama, and with unspeakable atrocities, massacred over 500 helpless men, women, and children. The howling savages at their bloody work made so hideous a scene that even their chief, a half-breed Indian named Weatherford, was filled with horror. He tried to protect the women and children, but his savage followers broke all restraint, and nothing could stop their cruel butchery. The Creeks ended by setting fire to the ruins of the fort. This Indian massacre at Fort Mims was one of the bloodiest in history. The news reached Tennessee, Arousing the country, Andrew Jackson rose from a sick bed, called together an army of volunteers, and led them against the Creeks. Davy Crockett Go ahead, Davy Crockett's motto. When Andrew Jackson called for volunteers to punish the Creeks, Davy Crockett, the famous Tennessee bear hunter, came hurrying to enlist. He was a backwoodsman, born and reared in a log cabin in the wilderness. Armed with his long rifle and hunting knife, dressed in a hunting shirt and fox skin cap, with the tail hanging down behind, he was a picturesque figure. He was merry as well as fearless, and kept the soldiers in a constant roar of laughter with his jokes and funny stories. He was kind hearted and gave away his money to any soldier who needed it. Go ahead, was his motto, whenever facing difficulty or dangers. Some years after the Creek War, he took part in the struggle for liberty in Texas. With Travis and Bowie, he defended the Alamo. Go ahead, liberty and independence forever, wrote Davy Crockett in his diary just before the Alamo fell. Chief Weatherford Andrew Jackson carried forward his Indian campaign with crushing effect. Blow after blow fell upon the doomed creeks, and at the Battle of the Horseshoe he annihilated their power forever. The creeks were conquered, but their chief, Weatherford, was still at large. Andrew Jackson gave orders for his pursuit and capture. He wished to punish him for his part in the massacre at Fort Mims. The Creek force under Weatherford had melted away. The warriors who were left after the battle had taken flight to a place of safety, leaving him alone in the forest with a multitude of Indian women and children, widows and orphans, perishing for want of food. It was then that Weatherford gave a shining example of humanity and heroism. He might have fled to safety with the rest of his war party. He chose to remain and to attempt, at the sacrifice of his own life, to save from starvation the women and children who were with him. He mounted his gray steed and directed his course to General Jackson's camp. When only a few miles from there, a fine deer crossed his path and stopped within shooting distance. Weatherford shot the deer and placed it on his horse behind the saddle. Reloading his rifle with two balls, for the purpose of shooting Big Warrior, a leading chief friendly to the Americans, if he gave him any trouble, Weatherford rode on. He soon reached the outpost of the camp. He politely inquired of a group of soldiers, where General Jackson was. An old man pointed out the general's tent, and the fearless chief rode up to it. Before the entrance of the tent sat Big Warrior himself. Seeing Weatherford, he cried out in an insulting tone, Ah, Bill Weatherford!
Rutherford, have we got you at last? With a glance of fire at Big Warrior, Weatherford replied with an oath, Traitor, if you give me any insolence, I will blow a ball through your cowardly heart. General Jackson now came running out of the tent. How dare you, exclaimed the general, furiously, right up to my tent after having murdered the women and children at Fort Mims. General Jackson replied Weatherford with dignity. I am not afraid of you. I fear no man, for I am a Creek warrior. I have nothing to request in behalf of myself. You can kill me if you desire. But I come to beg you to send for the women and children of the war party who are now starving in the woods. Their fields and cribs have been destroyed by your people. You have driven them into the woods without an ear of corn. I hope that you will send out parties who will conduct them safely here in order that they may be fed. I exerted myself in vain to prevent the massacre of the women and children at Fort Mims. I am now done fighting. The Red Sticks are nearly all killed. If I could fight you any longer, I would most heartily do so. Send for the women and children. They never did you any harm, but kill me if the white people want it done. While he was speaking, a crowd of officers and soldiers gathered around the tent. Associating the name of Weatherford with the oft-told horrors of the massacre, and not understanding what was going forward, the soldiers cast upon the chief glances of hatred and aversion. Many of them cried out, Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! Silence! exclaimed Jackson, and the clamor was hushed. Any man, added the general with great energy, who would kill as brave a man as this would rob the dead. He then requested Weatherford to alight and enter his tent, which the chief did, bringing in with him the deer he had killed by the way and presenting it to the general. Jackson accepted the gift and invited Weatherford to drink a glass of brandy, but Weatherford refused to drink, saying, General, I am one of the few Indians who do not drink liquor, but I would thank you for a little tobacco. Jackson gave him some tobacco, and they then discussed terms of peace. Weatherford explained that he wished peace in order that his nation might be relieved of their sufferings and the women and children saved. If you wish to continue the war, said General Jackson, you are at liberty to depart unharmed, but if you desire peace, you may remain and you shall be protected. And as Weatherford desired peace, General Jackson sent for the women and children and had them fed and cared for. When the war was over, Weatherford again became a planter, for he had been a prosperous one before he led his nation, the Creeks, on the warpath. He lived many years in peace with the white men in red, respected by his neighbors for his bravery, honor, and good native common sense. To the day of his death, Weatherford deeply regretted the massacre at Fort Mims. My warriors, said he, were like famished wolves, and the first taste of blood made their appetites insatiable. James Parton and Other Stories Sam Houston Years before the fall of the Alamo, during the Creek War, at the Battle of the Horseshoe, Andrew Jackson had just given the order for a part of his troops to charge the Indian breastwork. The troops rushed forward with loud shouts. The first in that rush was a young lieutenant, Sam Houston. As he led the way across the breastwork, a barbed arrow struck deep into his thigh. He tried to pull it out, but could not. He called to an officer and asked him to draw it out. The officer tugged at its shaft twice, but failed. Try again, shouted Sam Houston, lifting his sword, and if you fail this time, I will smite you to the earth. The officer, with a desperate effort, pulled out the arrow. A stream of blood gushed from the wound. 
Sam Houston recrossed the breastwork to the rear to have it dressed. A surgeon dressed it and staunched the flow of blood. Just then, Andrew Jackson rode up to see who was wounded. Recognizing his daring lieutenant, he forbade him to return to the fight. Under any other circumstances, Sam Houston would have obeyed without a word. But now he begged the general to allow him to go back to his men. General Jackson ordered him most peremptorily not to cross the breastwork again. But Sam Houston was determined to die in that battle or win fame forever. And soon after, when General Jackson called for volunteers to storm a ravine, Sam Houston rushed into the thick of the fight, and the next minute he was leading on his men. He received two rifle balls in his right shoulder, and his left arm fell shattered at his side. At last, exhausted by the loss of blood, he dropped to the ground. He eventually recovered, and the military prowess and heroism which he had displayed throughout this battle, secured for him the lasting regard of Old Hickory. Retold from The Life of Sam Houston Why Jackson was named Old Hickory When Andrew Jackson, with his Tennessee riflemen, was camping at Natchez, waiting for orders to move on to New Orleans, he received a dispatch from the War Department. It ordered him to dismiss his men at once. Jackson's indignation and rage knew no bounds. Dismiss them without pay, without means of transportation, without provision for the sick? Never! He himself would march them home again through the savage wilderness at his own expense. Such was his determination. And when his little army set out from Natchez for its march, of five hundred miles through the wilderness. There were a hundred and fifty men on the sick list, of whom fifty-six could not raise their heads from the pillow. There were but eleven wagons to convey them. The most desperately ill were placed in the wagons. The rest of the sick were mounted on the horses of the officers. General Jackson had three fine horses and gave them up to the sick himself briskly trudging on foot. Day after day he tramped gaily along the miry roads, never tired, and always ready with a cheering word for others. They marched with extraordinary speed, averaging eighteen miles a day, and performing the whole journey in less than a month, and yet the sick men rapidly recovered under the reviving influence of a homeward march. Where am I? asked one young fellow who had been lifted to his place in a wagon when insensible and apparently dying. On your way home, cried the general merrily, and the young soldier began to improve from that hour and reached home in good health. Many of the volunteers had heard so much of Jackson's violent and hasty temper that they had joined the corps with a certain dread and hesitation. Fearing not the enemy, nor the marches, nor diseases and wounds, so much as the swift wrath of their commander. How surprised were they to find that, though there was a whole volcano of wrath in their general, Yet to the men of his command, so long as they did their duty and longer, he was the most gentle, patient, considerate, and generous of friends. It was on this homeward march that the nickname of Old Hickory was bestowed on Andrew Jackson by his men. First of all, the remark was made by a soldier who was struck with his wonderful pedestrian powers, that the general was tough. Next it was observed of him that he was as tough as Hickory. Then he was called Hickory. Lastly, the affectionate adjective old was prefixed. And ever after he was known as Old Hickory. James Parton retold. The Cotton Bales We have all heard tell that Andrew Jackson and his riflemen fought the Battle of New Orleans from behind cotton bales. This is a mistake. 
yet it is true that old hickory did commandeer a whole cargo of cotton bales and with them built a bastion in front of his guns but at the very first bombardment the balls from the british batteries knocked the bales in all directions while wads from the american guns and spurting flames from the muzzles of the rifles set some of the bales afire they fell smouldering into the ditch outside and lay there sending up smoke and choking odors when the bombardment was over the american soldiers dragged the unburnt cotton bales to the rear they cut them open and used the layers of cotton for beds after the battle of new orleans the british troops had retreated before the savage crackling of the tennessee and kentucky rifles the american artillery which had continued to play upon the british batteries ceased their fire for the guns to cool and the dense smoke to roll away the whole american army crowded in triumph to the parapet and looked over into the field what a scene was gradually disclosed to them the plain was covered and heaped with the british dead and wounded the american soldiers to their credit be it repeated were appalled and silenced at the sight before them dressed in their gay uniforms cleanly shaven and attired for the promised victory and triumphal entry into new orleans the stalwart men lay on the gory field frightful examples of the horrors of war strangely did they contrast with those ragged begrimed long-haired pioneer men who crowding the american parapet stood surveying the destruction their long rifles had caused on the edge of the woods there were many british soldiers who being slightly wounded had concealed themselves under brush and in the trees and it was pitiable to hear the cries for help and water that arose from every quarter of the field as the americans gazed on this scene of desolation and suffering a profound and melancholy silence pervaded the army no sounds of exultation or rejoicing were heard pity and sympathy had succeeded to the boisterous and savage feelings which a few minutes before had possessed their souls many of the americans stole without leave from their positions and with their canteens gave water to the dying and assisted the wounded those of their enemy who could walk the americans led into the lines where they received attention from jackson's medical staff others who were desperately wounded the americans carried into camp on their backs jackson sent a message to new orleans to dispatch all the carts and vehicles to the lines late in the day a long procession of these carts was seen slowly winding its way along the levee from the field of battle they contained the british wounded the citizens of new orleans men and women pressed forward to tender every aid to their suffering enemies by private subscription the citizens supplied mattresses and pillows lint and old linen all of which articles were then exceedingly scarce in the city women nurses cared for the british and washed at their bedsides night and day several of the officers who were grievously wounded were taken to private residences and were provided with every comfort such acts as these ennoble humanity and soften the horrors of war james parton retold end of chapter sixteen recording by bill mosley lano county texas u s a Chapter Seventeen of Good Stories for Great Birthdays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Betty B. Good Stories for Great Birthdays by Francis Jenkins Olcott. April 13th, Thomas Jefferson, the framer of the Declaration of Independence. All honor to Jefferson, to the man who, in the concrete pressure of a struggle for national independence by a single people, had the coolness, forecast, and capacity to introduce into a merely revolutionary document an abstract truth applicable to all men and all times and so to embalm it there that to-day and in all coming days it shall be a rebuke and a stumbling-block to the very harbingers of reappearing tyranny and oppression abraham lincoln the fourth of july eighteen twenty six is it the fourth no not yet they answered but twill soon be early morn we will wake you if you slumber when the day begins to dawn then the statesman left the present lived again amid the past saw perhaps the peopled future lived again amid the past till the flashes of the morning lit the far horizon low and the sun's rays o'er the forest in the east began to glow evening in majestic shadows fell upon the fortress's walls sweetly were the last bells ringing on the james and on the charles mid the choruses of freedom two departed victors lay one beside the blue ravanna one by massachusetts bay hezekiah butterworth condensed thomas jefferson was born in virginia april thirteenth seventeen forty three framed the declaration of independence seventeen seventy six was elected governor of virginia seventeen seventy nine appointed secretary of state in washington's cabinet seventeen eighty nine elected third president of the united states eighteen hundred he died on the fiftieth anniversary of the signing of the declaration of independence the fourth of july eighteen twenty six he was called the sage of monticello monticello was the name of his fine country estate the boy owner of shadwell farm thomas jefferson was a boy of seventeen tall raw-boned freckled and sandy-haired he came to williamsburg from the far west of virginia to enter the college of william and mary with his large feet and hands his thick wrists and prominent cheekbones and chin he could not have been accounted handsome or graceful he is described however as a fresh bright healthy-looking youth as straight as a gun-barrel sinewy and strong with that alertness of movement which comes of early familiarity with saddle gun canoe and minuet his teeth too were perfect his eyes which were of hazel gray were beaming and expressive his home shadwell farm was a hundred and fifty miles to the northwest of williamsburg among the mountains of central virginia it was a plain spacious farmhouse a story and a half high with four large rooms and a wide entry on the ground floor and many garret chambers above the farm was nineteen hundred acres of land part of it densely wooded and some of it so steep and rocky as to be unfit for cultivation the farm was tilled by thirty slaves and thomas jefferson this student of seventeen through the death of his father was already the head of the family and under a guardian the owner of shadwell farm the best portion of his father's estate his father peter jefferson had been a wonder of physical force and stature he had the strength of three strong men two hogsheads of tobacco each weighing a thousand pounds he could raise at once from their sides and stand them upright when surveying in the wilderness he could tire out his assistants and tire out his mules then eat his mules and still press on sleeping alone by night in a hollow tree to the howling of the wolves till his task was done from this natural chief of men thomas jefferson derived his stature his erectness and his bodily strength james parton arranged a christmas guest shadwell farm was a good farm to grow up on thomas jefferson and his noisy crowd of schoolfellows hunted on a mountain near by which abounded in deer turkeys foxes and other game jefferson was a keen hunter eager for a fox swift of foot and sound of wind coming in fresh and alert after a long day's clamoring hunt he studied hard for he liked books as much as fox hunting soon he began to be impatient to enter college then too he had never seen a town nor even a village of twenty houses and he was curious to know something of the great world 
his guardian consenting he bade farewell to his mother and sisters and set off for williamsburg a five days long ride from his home but just before he started for college he stayed over the holidays at a merry house in hanover county where he met for the first time a jovial blade named patrick henry noted then only for fiddling dancing mimicry and practical jokes jefferson and henry became great friends jefferson had not a suspicion of the wonderful talent that lay undeveloped in the prime mover of all the fun of that merry company while as little doubtless did patrick henry see in this slender sandy-haired lad a political leader and associate yet only a few years later in may seventeen sixty five patrick henry was elected a member of the house of burgesses and jefferson was to become a brilliant law student in seventeen seventy five jefferson was elected a delegate to the continental congress that declared the independence of the united states of america james parton arranged the author of the declaration the english settlers of virginia brought with them english rights and liberties the settlers and their descendants were forever to enjoy all liberties franchises and immunities enjoyed by englishmen in england they received from england the right to make their own laws if not contrary to the laws of england it was the governor of virginia who summoned the first representative assembly that ever met in america the first american colonial legislature this happened about a year before the pilgrim fathers reached the new world and drew up the mayflower compact it was not strange therefore that thomas jefferson born and reared in the atmosphere of virginia freedom should have been a patriot who fearlessly defended american liberty he was also a man of unusual intellectual power and a writer of elegant prose so when congress appointed a committee to draft the declaration of independence he was made a member of that committee when the committee met the other members asked thomas jefferson to compose the draft he did so the committee admired his draft so much that with but few changes they submitted it to congress after a fiery debate some alterations being made congress adopted thomas jefferson's draft as the declaration of independence of the united states of america proclaim liberty july fourth seventeen seventy six the declaration was signed america was free joyously the great bell in the steeple of the state house of philadelphia swung its iron tongue and pealed forth the glad news proclaiming liberty throughout all the land the tidings spread from city to city from village to village from farm to farm there was shouting rejoicing bonfires and thanksgiving copies of the declaration were sent to all the states washington had it proclaimed at the head of his troops while far away in the wax haws nine-year-old andrew jackson read it aloud to an eager crowd of backwoods settlers the great bell the liberty bell that had proclaimed liberty was carefully treasured today it may be seen in independence hall as the old state house is now called around the crown of the liberty bell are inscribed the words which god almighty commanded the hebrews to proclaim to all the hebrew people every fifty years so that they should not oppress one another proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof twenty-three years before the declaration of independence was signed these prophetic words from the bible had been inscribed upon the crown of that great bell only a reprieve fondly do we hope fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away yet if god wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's two hundred and fifty years of unrequited toil shall be sunk and until every drop of blood drawn by the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword as was said three thousand years ago so still it must be said the judgments of the lord are true and righteous altogether abraham lincoln there were two statements in the declaration of independence which must have profoundly disturbed its signers all men are created equal and have the right to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness many of the signers were slaveholders thomas jefferson of virginia the framer of the declaration was an abolitionist and an active one throwing the weight of his great influence against the institution of slavery he earnestly believed that all men 
white and black alike are born equal so when he was asked to frame the declaration of independence he put into it a clause condemning the slave trade as an assemblage of horrors during the debate in the convention this clause was stricken out though jefferson had his reasons for not freeing his own slaves he continued to speak and write against slavery as a violation of human rights and liberties this abomination must have an end he said there were other americans who believed as he did george washington in his will left their freedom to his slaves to be given them after his wife's death he ordered a fund to be set aside for the support of all his old and sick slaves and he bade his heirs see to it that the young negroes were taught to read and write and to carry on some useful occupation kosciusko was jefferson's intimate friend and like him a believer in freedom for all men without regard to race or color before he left america kosciusko made a will turning over his american property to jefferson for the purchase of slaves from their owners and for their education so that when free they might earn their living and become worthy citizens from the time of jefferson until the civil war slavery to be or not to be was the burning question men and women especially those belonging to the society of friends devoted their lives to the abolition of slavery many of these abolitionists were mobbed and otherwise persecuted because of their humane efforts william lloyd garrison was the great leader of the abolitionists the quaker poet whittier was also a leader in the agitation against slavery but to go back to thomas jefferson when the missouri compromise went into effect and the house was divided against itself jefferson was deeply and terribly stirred he looked far into the future this momentous question he wrote like a fire bell in the night awakened and filled me with terror i considered it at once as the knell of the union it is hushed indeed for the moment but this is a reprieve only not a final sentence and again he said i tremble for my country when i reflect that god is just that his justice cannot sleep for ever first the reprieve then as the crime was continued the execution of the sentence nearly a hundred years of slavery passed after the framing of the declaration then on north and south fell the terrible retributive punishment of the civil war on the fourth of july eighteen twenty six it was the fourth of july the fiftieth anniversary of the signing of the declaration of independence in his home at monticello thomas jefferson had closed his eyes forever on the fourth of july the fiftieth anniversary of the signing of the declaration of independence End of chapter 17